welcome. My name is Cara O'Sullivan, and I serve the Boston College Cloud School of Theology and Ministry as Assistant Director of Continuing Education. Thank you for joining us for our second lecture in our Spring 2024 Continuing <coughs> Education Lecture Series. As part of the Cloud School's mission, we offer an array of enrichment opportunities to foster Christian faith and promote lifelong learning. We do this with lectures like this one, as well as on-campus presentations, online courses, videos, and other resources for personal enrichment and professional development. Our CSTM online crossroad courses are underway and open for enrollment. The following two courses get underway next Wednesday, March 6. Black Catholic Spirituality. This course explores the black Catholic Christian experience in the United States and aims to bring to light challenges and prejudices faced by black Catholics past and present as well as the deep faith, prayer, and community that they bring to the global church. And our other course starting next week is Retiring Gracefully. This course explores how God is present in our lives and working in the process from anticipation to realization of full after full time employment, full life after full time employment. More information on these courses is available by visiting bc.edu slash crossroads. Don't miss your opportunity to enroll. We have an, a number of upcoming lectures this spring, and I'll briefly mention the next one. On Saturday, March 23rd, please join us in person at 10 a.m. in Gasson Hall on the main campus for our annual Underhill Lecture in Christian Spirituality. This year's speaker, Brian Robinette, Boston College Associate Professor of Theology, will offer the lecture, Beyond the Reactive Mind, Christian Contemplative Practice in Polarized Times. Information on this and our other upcoming lectures will be included in our follow-up email. We, can ho we hope that you can join us for our future event or enroll in a course. Thanks to our presenters for granting us permission to record this presentation, including the Q&A portion. We're so grateful for the opportunity to extend the life of this lecture. Within about one month, you'll find um, the video posted on our Encore Archive, our encore archive at bc.edu slash Encore. Bookmarks with this web address are available at the entrance to this room. At the end of this presentation, there'll be an opportunity for conversation and Q&A. Our graduate assistants, Thais and Sebastian, will circulate with microphones during the Q&A portion of this event. We'll aim to answer as many questions as possible. We ask that if you do ask a question, that you please wait for the microphone. And please know that if you do ask a question, it will likely be part of the final video and may have a very long life. So just be sure you're OK with that before you ask a question. <laughs> now I invite Megan DiDios, Director of Continued Education, to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming, and welcome to this presentation, Beyond the Veil, Exploring Death and Buddhism and Christianity. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is Gen Kelzang Kedru, a Buddhist monk and meditation teacher for over 30 years. He has been practicing under the guidance of the venerable Geshe Kelzang Gyatso Rinpoche. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. <laughs> he was helping me earlier. A Harvard alumnus, he has taught Buddhism and meditation across the country, and he regularly gives special events at universities and in corporate settings. Through his deep understanding of Buddhist teaching, Yen Kedru provides an inspiring example of a contemporary Buddhist practitioner. He has served as the resident teacher in Chicago and in Seattle. Yen Kudrup is currently the resident teacher at Kadampa Meditation Center Boston, located in Davis Square. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Our other speaker is CSTM's own Professor Felix Pelosi. <laughs> a Latin American lay theologian, he holds degrees of doctor in theology and licentiate in dogmatic theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University of Rome, a baccalaureate in philosophy and a baccalaureate in theology from the Pontifical Salesian University of Rome, and a licentiate in education with mention in philosophy earned from the Jesuits Catholic University, Andres Bello in Caracas. Currently, he's an associate professor of the practice here at Boston College Clow School of Theology and Ministry and serves as the director of Formacion Continua, a program which promotes theological, spiritual, and ministerial training to the Hispanic community. Pastorally, Professor Palazzi serves Hispanic communities and the Boston area, offering formation and gospel reading groups. And he's a great friend to continue education. We share a space in the Symboli Hall. 
We are honored to have both Professor Palazzi and Gen Kedru with us tonight for what should be a fascinating presentation and discussion. Please join me in welcoming them. Welcoming them. All righty. Sound check. Can you hear me in the back row? How is the volume level? Can I get a thumbs up at the back? Fantastic. So thank you very, very much for uh, uh, coming out this evening. Um, when I was driving over from where I live and work over in Davis Square, um, I was thinking a lot about this event and I was just so inspired to just be a kind neighbor. You know, in our world, there's a lot of range, you know, of people's religious face and background. I've had the good fortune to know Felix for the last couple of years. And uh, I was very grateful for the opportunity to come here and to try to just share a few ideas around a Buddhist approach to death and dying. You know, we're not debating. <laughs> we're trying to simply sort of share so we can be in more informed citizens uh, in our great city. So I don't know. How, how many of you met a Buddhist monk before? Oh my gosh, fantastic. You've got a lot of good learning going on here. So I hope I can add to your already uh, good knowledge. Yeah, and if those of you are coming across a Buddhist monk or teachings for the first time, uh, I really hope it's helpful for you. Okay. So what I decided to do for uh, today's event uh, is I picked out a few simple paragraphs to share uh, from a book entitled Living Meaningfully, Dying Joyfully, which is a, a, a relatively intermediate text on Buddhist understanding of what is death, what is the death process, what are some prayers we can do for those that we love when they are dying. So it gets into a little bit more advanced territory. But what I thought for today's event was I could share just a few like basic level paragraphs, offer a few comments, and, uh, and then during the, the q and I'm happy to go as far down the rabbit hole as you wish, <laughs> what your questions may be. Uh, is that okay? So I, think, well, I think we're each gonna try to keep it to sort of 20-ish odd minutes. And we can have a little conversation with the person beside you and uh, a little Q&A time. Lovely. So the first paragraph I chose for us to consider tonight. Contemplating our own death will inspire us to use life wisely by developing the inner refuge of spiritual realizations. Otherwise, we'll have no ability to protect ourselves from the sufferings of death and what lies beyond. <coughs> Moreover, when someone close to us, such as a parent or friend, is dying, we'll be powerless to help them, because we'll not know how. And we'll experience sadness and frustration at our inability to be of genuine help. Preparing for death is one of the kindest and wisest things we can do for both ourselves and others. So contemplating our own mortality uh, is one of the very core uh, contemplations within Buddhist spiritual training. It's not something we just check in about, you know, later on in life, you know, but uh, it helps us, uh, it's designed to help us live a more meaningful life in the present. Okay. And there's this interesting theme within Buddhist spiritual practice as a default trying to be kind to other people, but recognizing that our ability to be of more benefit to others also depends upon getting our own house in order. All right? If we are overly agreeable, <laughs> always saying yes, never saying what we think, you know, sometimes if we're not sort of like strong on the inside, our ability to give to others is a little bit weak. It was an interesting, bold statement, contemplating our own death as one of the kindest things and wisest things we can do for ourselves uh, and for also for others, uh, those that we love. Okay? And just a fun little anecdote. I, I was very good friends with both my grandmothers, who are affectionately called Florida Grandma and Toronto Grandma. <laughs> so you may be able to guess why this was. One was a snowbird half the year down in Florida, and one was not. 
And uh, yeah, I remember I was very good friends with you know, both my grandmothers. And uh, uh, Florida grandma grew up in rural Ontario, where like her whole world was just family, church, school, or work. And then like one of her grandkids becomes a Buddhist monk. She's like, what is up with that? <laughs> So we had so many amazing talks, you know, over the years. And um, yeah, yeah, they're very, very close to her. I remember going to visit the last time. And, uh, you know, she showed an example of this Buddhist principle. I remember my, you know, last visit with her. You know, we're visiting for a while. And um, she was utterly at peace, having contemplated her mortality and coming to terms with it. It was so beautiful. I remember some of her last words were, to me, saying, it's okay, you can go now and live your life. You know, like, like she had really come to terms with her own mortality. He was kind to her, and it was kind, you know, to those that she, she loved. The fact of the matter is that this world is not our home. We are travelers passing through. We came from our previous life, and in a few years or a few days, we'll move on to our next life. We entered this world empty-handed and alone, and we will leave empty-handed and alone. Everything we've accumulated in this life, including our very body, will be left behind. All we can take with us from one life to the next are the imprints of the positive and negative actions we have created. If we ignore death, we'll waste our life working for things we'll only have to leave behind, creating many negative actions, and in the process having to travel on to our next life with nothing but a heavy burden of negative karma. Of course, in Buddhism and Christianity, we've got some different language, you know, uh, so of course, maybe some different terminology. But, you know, maybe you have a similar feeling in this example of this world not being our home. You know, we are a traveler uh, passing through. And we're invited. I'm going to explain the death meditation in just a few short minutes. You know, but it's a, it's a simple, obvious truth. We entered this world empty-handed and alone. And we will leave empty-handed and alone. Isn't it? There's a few people in our orbit who we love, who we cherish, you know, but those people who are really close when we were like, you know, nine years old in grade school, <laughs> you know, or this little chapter. You know, many amazing segments of our life. But I find this contemplation can, you know, build some sort of ownership over our own personal journey. Yeah, as I said, if we ignore death, you know, we become maybe too much focused on things that will only uh, have to leave behind. Okay. There's a very famous story of a, uh, a Tibetan Buddhist practitioner called Mondro Chodak. Apologize for all the strange words. Anyways, <laughs> famous story passed down over the centuries of this uh, Tibetan Buddhist practitioner called Mondro Chodak. And when he was a young man, he was super charismatic, super like successful, always traveling. You know, he had like frequent flyer miles, whatever. <laughs> he was one of these people in his youth who was just, everybody loved him. He was funny, charismatic, popular. He was struck down by illness. And as the story goes, his grandmother was asking him, why are you looking so glum? You're always usually so happy and confident. So I'm doing the math. His grandmother's still alive, so he's not terribly old. And he was just sort of pondering, and he said, my whole life, people have told me how funny I am, how successful, you know, how charismatic. And he said, they tricked me. He said, my whole life, I've ignored my spiritual practice, just distracted, you know, by what everyone else is thinking. And I've always found this so striking. Like, he wasn't being, like, unkind to others, but, like, he's saying, they tricked me. 
<laughs> I've been so busy caring what other people think, trying to accumulate all these things. I've completely ignored healing something within me. It's not like if we don't contemplate our mortality. It's an old famous Buddhist story. We, we may sort of find ourselves like Monjo Chodak, like, oops. <laughs> I've invested so much time and energy, and now that it's time to go, you know, like, there's all this untapped potential for more gratitude, for more wisdom, and like, oops, I just got money. <laughs> on the other hand, if we base our life on a realistic awareness of our mortality, we will regard spiritual development as far more important than the attainments of this world. We'll view our time principally as an opportunity to cultivate positive minds such as patience, love, and wisdom. Motivated by these virtuous minds, we'll perform many positive actions. And when death comes, we'll be able to pass away without fear or regret our mind empowered by the virtuous karma we have created. Okay. So a few little paragraphs, so just like general encouragement. Uh, second point I wanted to share uh, was just a little synopsis of a classic um, Buddhist contemplation on, on death. Okay? It has three uh, key points to it. And the first point is contemplating slowly. I will definitely die. Secondly, contemplating the time of my death is completely uncertain. And the third, at the time of my death and after, what will benefit me is my own spiritual experience. So it's one thing to know intellectually that we're going to die. But within Buddhist spiritual practice, it's said there can be a lot of learning by just sitting for periods of minutes, becoming very, very familiar. I will actually die. There is no way to prevent my body from decaying. Day by day, moment by moment, my life is slipping away. Rather than ignoring that truth, you know, Buddha invites us to sort of sit with that obvious truth and just get familiar with it. You know, so that, that is shaping uh, how we live. The second one is uh, maybe the, the crux of these three. It is sitting with a contemplative point that the time of my death is completely uncertain. You know, there's a joke goes, you know, we have a birth certificate, you know, but we don't have like a death certificate. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like the number's a little bit rubbed out. And uh, sometimes we can, I don't know, be a little bit of a control freak <laughs> and think like, well, you know, 70s is the new 50. So like, don't want to pass away too young. We, maybe we have like a target, you know, like some number we pick and we think like, I'm in control, I've had a good career, done lots of things in my life, and we feel like, like I'm going to make it at that exact age. And sometimes we try to find peace by being a control freak. And Buddha said there is more peace by learning how to step into our vulnerability, our uncertainty. Rather than this defensive, I'm going to outlive. I'm going to hit that magic number. It's not too young, not too old. We're like, we're still this tight, controlling mind, thinking that will make me happy or have peace. The second point, it's, it's stepping into the uncertainty, the vulnerability. I have no idea when I will die. I'm 53 years old now, and I had a very good friend who's about my age who, like, just had a stroke the other year. You know, so maybe some of you are in your 50s or gone through this decade where, like, it starts to become a little bit uncertain. So again, sitting with this obvious truth, the time of my death 
is completely uncertain. Right? And trying to find some interesting peace, and I might suggest some gratitude for the day. <laughs> you know, gratitude for what we're able to do by, by embracing that vulnerability or uncertainty, rather than finding peace by like being a control freak, okay? And the third contemplative point, we sit, my death is certain, I will definitely die. The time of my death is uncertain. And the third point, from in Buddhist language, at the time of my death and after, it is my own experience of spiritual training that will be of benefit to me. Okay? So when, when I taught in Chicago for a number of years, I became friends with a lot of, uh, I was in my 30s, became friends with a lot of retired European gentlemen. I lived in an area called Oak Park, Illinois, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, and a uh, beautiful area of Chicago. And they turned a street into a pedestrian street, so no more cars going. And uh, populating all of the benches were these whole bunch of cool, retired European gentlemen. And I'd walk down the street to my Buddhist meditation center, at the beginning, they'd like make fun of me because I look unusual. You know, then we became friends. We'd go out for lunch. I'd visit him in the hospital. <laughs> I got to know all these men. And there was one man, and uh, they always had this little Chicago edge. I remember one day he was like, so Kedrup, so you, you, you Buddhists, you believe in future lives or something, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, is there any way I can bring my money with me? <laughs> he had become really, really successful. He had like a fancy, you know, like place down on the Gold Coast. I saw a little nod from some people who know, like Chicago geography. I had become very, very successful. Uh, cost him his marriage. Cost him his adult daughter no longer speaking to him. But he's got a lot of money. <laughs> You know, and he was sort of saying, like, like, I can't buy my way out of letting go. My ability to let go, it's not how many people think I'm, it's not my reputation. I can't buy my way through this process of letting go. I need to have worked out the ability to love others 100%. And with an open hand, I can't control them. You know, it's our own inner experience of gratitude, love, that will help us at the time of death and after. So we put these three together. We think, my death is certain, time is uncertain, and at the time of death and after, it's my spiritual experience that will be a benefit to me. It gives us the energy, I've got to do some spiritual learning and practice right now. I can't have the development of my faith <laughs> like rushing it all right at the end. I don't know how long I'm going to have. It overcomes procrastination. <clears throat> you know, we value every day and time that we have. And we log in the time and energy, you know, in, maybe in your language, to become more Christ-like. You know, whatever it is. Like, I've got to begin that inner journey, <coughs> you know, now rather than waiting. Okay. This is like traditional, classic Buddhism 101, meditation on death. My death is certain. Time is uncertain. And at the time of death and after, what will benefit me is my spiritual experience. And last little reading before I pass this over to my dear friend Felix. Um, what is death? Death is the cessation of the connection between our mind and our body. Most people believe that death takes place when the heart stops beating. But this does not mean the person has died, because his subtle mind may still remain in his body. Death occurs when the subtle consciousness finally leaves the body and goes to the next life. Our body is like a guest house, and our mind is like the guest. When we die, our mind has to leave this body and enter the body of our next rebirth, like a guest leaving one guest house and traveling to another. When the body disintegrates at death, the mind does not cease. Although our superficial conscious 
mind ceases. It does so by dissolving into a deeper level of consciousness, the very subtle mind. And the continuum of the very subtle mind has no beginning and no end. It is this mind which, when thoroughly purified, transforms into the omniscient mind of a Buddha. Okay? So we have some different terminology in Buddhism, but it, it said we have our gross waking mind. That temporarily vanishes every time we fall asleep at night. It said in the death process, similarly, our mind becomes more subtle. You know, and our very subtle mind, which interestingly is said to be located in the region of your heart. I'm not sure, where is, if you were to point to your soul, <laughs> you know, generally, it's not your thinky mind upstairs. And similarly in Buddhism, it said, you know, our, our gross waking consciousness does cease. It dissolves into a deeper level of our mind, within Buddhism called our very subtle mind. And it is this which goes from one life to the next. Okay. Often similarly, may be pointed at as being in the region of the heart center. Okay, I hope this is helpful. I don't want to be overly like, like, like technical, but just just getting get letting you have a feel of what is a Buddhist practitioner like. Uh, what are some simple thoughts or attitudes, you know, around um, yeah, encouraging us to contemplate our death, how to do it, and a little technical point at the end. So I really hope that's helpful. I'm looking forward to seeing what dear Felix is going to say. I get to now kick back and listen. Uh, yeah, I chose to go first because now I get to relax. <laughs> so please, my dear friend Felix. Thank you. I really wish you one day you have this sense of gratitude and fulfillment that I have right now. I have been baptized the 19th of May of 1968. And New Year, Eve, New Year Eve 2022, I was at 8.30 p.m. at Cambridge. And I have that feeling that I belong to this community. And this community is the Kadampa community, where I have learned that Buddha is a doctor, the Dharma is the medicine, and the Sangha, the community, is the hospital. It's so beautiful how Buddha invite us, what Pope Francis is inviting us to transform our communities. I don't have any doubt and any sense, more sense of gratitude mm -hmm. to have found my community outside my church. It means the sense of gratitude that I have right now and the fulfillment. Mm -hmm. I wish you that one day you can experience that sense. Okay, <laughs> allow me to present a great tool, theological tool, but not just theological tool, a really great tool that will help you to solve so many problems. The dog rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> and because life is sometimes, and most of the times, a dog rabbit. <laughs> and we are always fighting, it's black, white, either, or. And we're gonna talk a lot about the dog rabbit today. And that is the reason why I wanted to present and introduce my friend that in my classes is really famous, the dog rabbit. And it has to do with death. And I will touch like a phenomenology of death, that death in general, and then I will go deep, more or less touching, just touching the theology of the death we can understand in a Christian perspective. 200,000 of years, 200,000 of years, or maybe 300,000 of years, Homo sapiens came in this reality that we call Earth. Billions and billions of years with massive extinctions. We came and we are really young species. And was a fact that the archaeology is fine that was determined when we started to put some amulets in the corpse and take care of the people that we left behind. And that shaped our brain in a definitive way. That shaped our brain, and it's really curious that death has been one of the elements that have moved our intelligence to understand what the Homo sapiens is. It means we were aware of our mortality. I have to come back to my notes. Mm. means we started to be aware of the mortality. That is absolutely 
determinant. Because other living beings can feel sorrow, other living beings can feel grief even, but just the sapiens can symbolize death. Just the sapiens, in an unconscious or conscious way, I know that I will die. I mean, I choose to be a theologian for bad or for good. But I cannot be an astronaut. I cannot be president of the United States. I know that I have a limited time. Then I choose to be this. There are so many jokes that I can do right now, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I choose to be a theologian. And I know in an unconscious way or a conscious way that is, is limited. Uh, at the same time, we, as a homo sapiens, we lead, we have trouble with the ends. We struggle to the ends. Everything ends. A relationship ends. A good book ends. A good food ends. A good job ends. Your prestige ends. But not only in the natural order or in the earth. We know that the stars end. Even if we continue to see the light, it seems it's something natural and normal that everything ends. But we struggle with this idea of end. When I came to America, uh, I had the big popcorns, <laughs> these massive popcorns, the massive beverages that <laughs> The film is not started and you say, oh my God, <laughs> what I've done. <laughs> no. we, 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 we struggle with the idea of ants. We don't know how to live with ants. And, and that is, an, is, is a really a problem. No? And that is not philosophical. Let's go to physical. Each time that we breathe, we are breathing our own death. We inhale and exhale oxygen. And it's so stupid that if I say, I don't want to die, <laughs> I will die. It means, again, the dog rabbit, life and death, it seems to be together. I am dying. I am not getting younger. And I have a limited time. I can be conscious or continue to eat popcorn and beverages for a long time, <laughs> thinking that nothing is going to happen. But it is that. I mean, it is there, the, the, the awareness of dying. And, and obviously, the counterpart is the idea of immortality. We are immortals. The counterpart, the fear of dying, we bring immortality. The pharmaceutic, cosmetics, but even religions has been grounded in that immortality, idea of immortality. And we need to talk about immortality. We need to understand what we understand as a Christian when immortality. What exactly means that idea of immortality? Because this idea traps us in our own traps. I don't want to die. My ego wants to survive beyond death. When, when we decided to talk about death, uh, I say to Genke Drut, hey, I don't want to talk about reincarnation and resurrection. No, I want to talk about death. And, and why? It's not because we are interested to talk about something, and I am a professor in eschatology, that means we talk, I, I teach these things, uh, then I'm shooting my feet with that. Uh, we don't want to talk about what comes after we die. That is not our interest. Our interest is to talk before we die. If we are concerned about death, it's not because we want to spread fear or we want to bring some people in, in my group. It's because we are, as Ken Kedrut say, and invite us to think, how death brings us into a deep sense of life. If we as theologians are interested to talk about that, and if we 
are as a human being interested to talk about death is not because we are interested to, to understand what comes after we die, it's before we die. And I think that, that that idea of immortality, the concept of immortality, I know is bringing me to a big complex topic in Christian theology, the separate soul, the body. What is the body? My dear Christians, we have troubles with the body. If there is something that we struggle, it's with the core of the Christian faith, the flesh. That is not so paradox that we struggle with the body. See, the whole problems that we have in theology how re are related with the body. Hmm? And let me invite you to have an exercise right now. We are like really certain that we have a body. Obviously, again, hmm? again, the dog rabbit. <laughs> we have a body. Felix, what are you saying? I have a body. But I want to invite you to think. I don't have a body. I am a body. And it's beyond a half. Obviously, the certainty and the tranquility that I have when I have my phone in my hand. No? I have my phone. What are you saying? I have my phone. I have a soul. <laughs> I have a body. No? But when, when, we, when we start to say, do I really am friendly with everyone? Do I, I when, when I move to Anne, I am, start to certain, certain things there, no? But this illusion that my body ends where my skin ends is an illusion. My body doesn't end where my skin ends. I, I am not too philosophical here. Mothers, do your body if it ends where your skin ends? Mothers, do you know that your body doesn't end where your skin ends? Let me go beyond. This body that I have today is not a Cro-Magnon body. This is not a Neanderthal body. Biologically, of the whole information I was trying these days, I and mean, was a baby crying for two hours. You know? I say, how vulnerable is this being in front of me? And at the same time has the potentiality to be the next president of the United States, maybe, or, yeah, or poet, or writer. How wonderful is the human being? He has already the whole information to draw. At the same time, vulnerable. And the whole information there is, is a biological stuff. I will learn how to walk. But it's not just a biological stuff. Yesterday I was in a concert, an Spanish one, and in, the drums start to sound and just start to move, like, hey, hey, hey. Yeah. And then, well, the Americans were. Hmm? <laughs> I don't know what to do with this song. No? Body. It has to do with culture. Body has to do where I grew up. As a Venezuelan, we pointed with the mound. You can be in a table, and you point with the mound, and we're going to know what exactly you're pointing. We're not going to kiss you. <laughs> but we know. And when I was in Italy, the little were like talking with the hands. No? Body. Is beyond, and if the album, I don't want to go forward, no? But if we think in body, like in mathematics, like a set of natural numbers that we can put and add and nothing change, hmm? it's a mathematic. When I was learning mathematics, you can take this number out and nothing change. Or if you think as a body, as a system that you cannot take out of your heart without affecting everything. It's my invitation to think, when I think body, what I am saying. What exactly is body? Because in certain way, we can ignore what that means. Ah, it's my body what I. My soul is like, it's like to change horses. No? It's changing horses. Done. And that way, we diminish 
the drama and the reality of the death. I think that is important to understand what, uh, what body means in order to understand what it is. Another point that I'm not going to go like, really deep is death, brother of sin. Hmm? And it has been a difficult point because we already say that death is natural. As I am a theologian and I want to stay Catholic and remain Catholic in certain ways, we have to affirm that death is product of sin. If we contemplate what is happening in Ukraine, in Palestine, in the forest of the Diden, death is product of sin. But it's not that idea of crazy theologian that is here. Let's return to Genesis 3 and see how beautiful it is. God gave us, and read when Eve is talking, one of us is talking, a woman is talking, and she say, you can eat of all trees of the paradise. I have say, we die. I've talk, mentioned immortality. Genesis 3 talk about the logic of gratuity. The unlimited is just an illusion. Always there is a limit. But see how Genesis 3 bring us this. God gave us to form all three of the paradise to eat. But do not eat of this one because you will die. Read that not in a concert. Read that as a narrative because it's a narrative. And you will see there is a logic of the gratuity what only limit is life. I don't want you to die. And as I don't want you to die, please do not eat of this. Read it in a different way. As a reaffirmation of the logic of gratuity. The logic of gratuity, the limit that God set us, is the life itself. I came to give you life and give you life in abundance. John. And it's so beautiful how the limit that God set up to us is life itself. And I will go deep in that right now. But obviously we have transformed this narrative in an idea, in a concept, we have fight, we have kill. It's not curious that if Adam and Eve broke that and did that, why in the Genesis there is not the death of Adam and Eve? What is the first death that appears? A killing. It's not wonderful. Jesus is not going to die in a bed. He's going to die. Kill. It's so wonderful. In that way, we can understand that death is part of a sin. There is a death that is part of a sin. When I exclude the other, when I reject the other, then it's sin. I want to finish with my last course that I did with my students. I read Carbart. And he is commenting the Epistle of the Romans. And it was a sentence that has been me walking Nacho for so many times, <laughs> like a mantra. And, and see how beautiful it is, because now you will understand what is immortality. There is no such a thing as a life in itself. And, and take it. There is no such a thing as a life in itself. There is only life in relationship to God. So powerful. And, and he's not bringing this idea from nothing. Read Romans 14. And we'll see exactly, but, but, but grab this. There is no such a thing as a life in itself. There is no such a thing as a life in itself. We say, yeah, yeah, there is life. 
Oh, what are you saying? You're saying there is no life. I, I wake up this morning. Hmm? That is normal. I, did, I went to my work. I did everything. There is no such a thing as a life in itself. <coughs> there is so only life in a relationship with God. What is the density of my day is the relationship with God. We all want to go to heaven. Hmm? And we have done so many things bringing people to heaven. Hmm? Continents. All continents kill. Trying to bring baptizing people and bring it to heaven. Heaven is not a space. Heaven is a person. Jesus. And this is exactly what <coughs> brings us the quality and the reality of my Christian faith. Do I really want to be with Jesus today? Oh, well, no, I want to be heaven. But do I really dream to be with Jesus? Do I really wish to be with him? Is really the density of my life to be with him? Is really my life, the reality of my life, in relationship with God? I repeat again, is life in this, such life in itself doesn't have any reality. There is no such thing as a life in itself. There is no such a thing as a life in itself. Have you not done that experience? When you were dating someone, you are in, in a restaurant. Hmm? And in that restaurant, there are two couples fighting. Number one is like maybe with anxiety. But you are in love. And, and the moon is absolutely different. Hmm? And the food tastes wonderful. No? And, and everything is so splendid. But for the other people, it's exactly the same thing. It's the social thing. It's, they're fighting. It means we, we have like make, we transform this desire to be in heaven. What is immortal? I don't have any right to be immortal. What makes me immortal is his relationship with him. What makes me immortal is his love. I don't have a soul that makes me the right to be immortal. What transforms my immortality is my relationship with God. It's that relationship that transforms my life. It's that relationship that makes me immortal. Grace. <coughs> what we call grace. Another one to end is but the death that is in death is the freedom of God, which is for us life. Yeah. How wonderful is this one? Death is the freedom of God. What we believe is madness. What we follow is absolute madness. A God that has died for me. And dying for me has transformed what death was. And death is no longer death. The Golgotha is the seventh day of the creation. When he in silence comes and transforms the whole creation and I make everything new. I make everything new. It's a wonderful mystery that we're going to celebrate. Never the sun was so inside the earth. Never the sun was so inside the earth. Madness. And we have, like, forgotten that one. I know. We know all the, all the stories. It's going to explain in the resurrection. And that's exactly the problem. We don't take death really serious. I just pointed some topics. But if you want to go deep there, there are a lot to talk. A lot to go deep in that, no? Obviously, we know that he will resurrect it because, but, but that out of freedom of God, that he died for us, transforming what was death, a natural thing, he transformed life for us. Finally, I want to finish with one prayer that I wrote, and obviously, I pray always in Spanish, and this is the reason why I will do it first in Spanish, and then I will do it in English. 
cuando cruza el umbral de la muerte, permíteme cruzar con los ojos abiertos. Y si después solo hay oscuridad, seré igualmente agradecido de haber vivido una vida acorde a un Dios que me amó con tanta fuerza. Y si después te encuentro a ti, solo habrá amor. And now, ahora, now in, 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 in English. Allow me to cross the abyss of the dead with my open eyes. And afterwards, there is only darkness. I will be deeply grateful to have lived according to the most beautiful story of a God who made my flesh his own. And if you are there, then there will be love. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would just want to say thank you for a wonderful presentation that was really enlightening. And so, um, so thank you for that. Um, I just had a question um, for, so Gan, yes, Kendrew, yep. Kendrew, okay. And also um, both of you. So you talked about um, the three elements um, about reflecting on death. And the, and the last one, my understanding was you said that spiritual preparation and spiritual practice prepares, benefits you in death and dying. Yeah. So I guess the question would be, um, for those people who may not have had a rich spiritual life, are the ability to, or even education or access to develop and have a spiritual life over their lives. Um, what is death and dying for those people? And how, you know, or even just say, for example, the average person who's just trying to go to the grocery store and make it to work <laughs> and doesn't, you know, have a daily spiritual practice. You know, what is, what is death and dying for those people? Do they, are they suffering? And how would one for those people, how, you know, that's very sad to me that, you know, those people might have a profoundly awful death and dying, and how, how would one alleviate that suffering for them, or, yeah. or how does one address that? Yeah, yeah. Sure. I, I can offer a little comment, because we seem to be making eye contact there. <laughs> so it, it said within Buddhist spiritual practice that if someone like we love and care about is approaching death, and maybe they haven't had much of a religious identity or vocabulary or, or, or sort of experience. Um, I'd say the most important thing in a Buddhist approach is to just help each other go through that process with a peaceful mind. We're not trying to put vocabulary on them. We're not trying to like <laughs> do anything to them other than just like help each other have a peaceful mind as we're letting go and passing away. Um, as far as having sort of like a rich spiritual life, um, yeah, my own limited experience of Buddhism is that it's, it's a much more open-handed um, understanding of spirituality in that Buddhist teachings give some really amazing methods for improving perhaps our mind of love, gratitude, compassion, but they are not uniquely owned by Buddhists. <laughs> You know, like we all do that as humans. So I think all of us, whether or not we have a box that we are ticking or have a certain, uh, you know, group identity, you know, if we're trying to be a good human, you know, a Buddhist is going to say, fantastic, you know, well done. And I think sort of knowing our time is limited, you know, we all try to become a better human, a better person. So I think from a Buddhist angle, it's like keep empowering that. You know, some people have, they don't want any religious identity. They don't want to, you know, sort of belong. But I think we can all help each other still become better people. And, and that can at least put us in good direction. Um, anyways, a few little thoughts. I'm not sure if I got all the subtlety of the question, but something to get us rolling here. And uh, yeah, dear Felix, any? I will always, but I mean, I be almost be in the same direction and means uh, if you ask me why I am Christian, I will say because I found a God that assumed my human nature in so fully ways that humanized me and invited me to be more human. Then what 
what brings me mm. is that freedom to be fully human in a, in a way that being human, I am divinized. They come the divine in me. You know? Then I can be doing shopping and at the same time be open to the other, to the transcendence and to the history. And more I am open, more fully alive I am. Mm -hmm. To God, mm -hmm. to my brother, my sister, and to the reality. Thank you both. And I know that both of you have uh, respectfully studied each other's traditions. And uh, Felix, what have you learned about death in Buddhism that makes you a better Christian? And again, what have you learned about Christianity that makes you a better Buddhist? Ooh, <laughs> I feel I need to think. So you mentioned <laughs> Felix first. So <laughs> 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 well, uh, so many things. It means uh, the first. Uh, the first thing is the sense of gratitude, of openness, of to embrace everyone, the compassion. I was sharing with with Glenn Kedrud. Uh, before coming to this uh, meeting. Before I was like always fighting with the idea of reincarnation because I was thinking that was like something that I do not believe. But then I learned with the time that the reincarnation is more to treat all living beings as your mother and your father. And such compassion I have not found anywhere. Mm. Such sense of compassion that is no theory. I experience that compassion each time that I go to the center. Mm. And no one judge me. Everyone receive mm. me with a laugh. And I know that everyone that is in that center, in my Sangha, we are in a hospital. And we need to be the medicine. And we need to be cured. No one mm. is looking mm. over the one. That such incredible sense of compassion I have found in the Buddhism. Mm. There are so many things as emptiness that I do not understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> there are so concepts that I am learning. I am learning names, Avalokiteshvara, <laughs> and I struggle with all so many things. But that sense of being alive and living with ordinary mm. problems as my anger, mm. as my frustrations, as my illusions, of my, the problem is not the other, the problem is, is me, <laughs> what I'm saying. You know? that, that practical way that I've learned in Buddhism is just such incredible treasure. I am so blessed mm -hmm. to be in a community that believe in Buddha, mm -hmm. that we listen to Dharma, and we practice in Dharma. Mm -hmm. Then uh, it's wonderful. I'll offer a few comments in your question, the, the generality of your question. Um, so I was not born in a Buddhist family. <laughs> so I was born in the, in the suburbs of Toronto, Canada. And, um, you know, for me, I went to the United Church of Canada, sort of like, like Anglican based. And, you know, my, my range of religious diversity was St. Mary's across the street. <laughs> it was like the Catholic Church. And when I was in university, um, I had a Hindu roommate, a Catholic roommate, a Jewish girlfriend. I finally took a class in world religions because I was like, what on earth is up? <laughs> <laughs> so I took the, my last two years, mostly at Harvard Divinity School, taking a lot of classes, worked in business. I became a Buddhist monk when I was 25. And I'd say as far as like the learning from each other, um, you know, I obviously had like Christian vocabulary when I was a young uh, child and young adult. Um, I found the approach, the introspective contemplative arts of Buddhism, I just loved it. And I'd say one thing that I started to notice was the more I studied Buddhism, my appreciation and respect 
for Christianity increased dramatically. You know, for example, like when I was young, the like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you know, like this, these elements, I just never really understood. And seeing some parallels within um, Buddhism, when I came across uh, teachings on a Buddha's truth body, enjoyment body, emanation body, there was things that I was seeing within a vocabulary that I was drawn to where it helped me have so much more respect, you know, and admiration for people who were, you know, um, getting nourishment out of their Christian faith. Um, when I lived in the Midwest, I had an experience for, I think, like eight or nine years in a row. There was a, a, a world religions professor from Lincoln Christian College in downstate Illinois who came up to Chicago <coughs> to try to, like, find some speakers for this small evangelical college. And um, they just weren't used to seeing anybody <laughs> who was not evangelical Christian. You know, and my friend Gary, he was bringing in, you know, like a rabbi and a Buddhist monk. And I remember chatting with these like young evangelical Christians over the years and just seeing so many more parallels than I appreciated as a kid of how they may pray, how they may worship, you know, and seeing how there was, although there's different terms and language, there was so much more commonality. Um, so I'd say my experience is like I had a little understanding of Christianity as a kid, but it was actually through studying Buddhism that like I admire it. Uh, I respect it. There's no wish to like convert or knock anybody, but like wanting to empower, you know, whatever anyone else is doing. Um, so yeah, I'd say like more appreciation and more respect. Um, yeah. Yeah, fun question. Hope that's helpful. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I liked your presentation, both of you. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess I think about it a lot. I grew up Catholic, but, but one of the fundamental attraction for me to Buddhism is really the, the notion of practice as opposed to theory. Or, I mean, we have contemplative practice, which the church doesn't teach anymore, prayer, which was wonderful. But the actual practice of practice, to me, is really helpful in, in contemplating death. The, the, one of the things I recall from a teacher, the idea that uh, all we take with us are the fruit of our action in terms of karma mm -hmm. and the idea that, you know, maybe helpful action or skillful, unskillful. But um, I think one of the reasons, perhaps this is such a good discussion, at the moment we can go to war in Iraq and leave a million people dead. We can do the same in Afghanistan and yet we can tolerate what's happening in Gaza. But yet collectively, as a culture, this culture does not want to deal with death. So, I mean, I think we have such profound uh, denial of death as a reality. So anything that can help us towards that awareness, personal death. Uh, but I like what Ram Das said. He said, all we're doing is walking each other home oh, as a contemplation. Yeah. I think that can be very helpful to me. Thank you both for uh, your talk tonight. Um, I teach across the street in the theology department and with my students, I always try and work death into the, the topic. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for a lot of the, the undergrads, they don't have much experience with them. And what I've found is the, the, one of the points in is funerals, that almost all of them have gone to funerals. And one of the texts we read is, it's from a Muslim theologian, but uh, he gives kind of pointers on how to practice or do a funeral, how to think about it, how to, uh, think about your own death and how to think about the death of the person. So uh, maybe an odd question here, but how do you practice a funeral or do you have any thoughts on, on how to approach this and what I might tell my students about thinking about this kind of topic? Both of you. Sure. I mean, I, mean I, can, I can say a few little words and just I can just share some unusual Buddhist language where you may like the principle of it. Um, so within Buddhist spiritual practice, uh, every month we do a special prayer session uh, called Poa Ceremony, where we're making prayers for everyone who has recently died, whether human or non-human, um, to take rebirth in what uh, we call within Buddhism a pure land. And a pure land is said to be a place where every appearance triggers or supports our virtuous minds, that often in ordinary society are our billboards, our news, that most of what appears 
triggers our frustration, our like low self-esteem, our jealousy, that it's very easy for things that appear to just naturally trigger or draw out just a lot of ordinary, somewhat toxic minds. So what we often make prayers for is that this person who has died, may they appear or experience an environment that we would call a pure land, where the appearances and everything coming at them is quickly drawing out all of that good potential. So that's something we do sort of on a rolling basis. And we're always getting requests for like, can you pray for my, my parent who passed away, for my child, for my pet? So poet ceremony is something we do uh, regularly. Um, and, and from time to time, you know, if there's a community member, you know, we would do sort of a larger, you know, like funeral ceremony with some speaking and so forth. But um, yeah, just, yeah, just sharing one practice we do monthly uh, called poet ceremony and a little word on Pure Land uh, just related to that. And dear yep. Felix? Uh, I would say something like, if I assume that I am a body, I don't have a body, that I am interconnected with others. We experience death in the death of the others. When death arrives to us, mm -hmm. it's too late. I am gone. I experience death in the death of the others. So many mm -hmm. times our heart mm -hmm. is gone mm -hmm. when the other is gone. When death arrives to us, it's too late. Mm -hmm. Then I want to assume mm -hmm the pain, and not just to say, she's with God, she's better. Hmm? No, 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 take, take really serious that moment. It's a drama. Don't, don't, oh, oh no, it's, going, it's with God, it's with heaven. I'm not going to go to resurrection because I'm going to take like three hours. But just take with that, do that. So no? but, but take really serious the moment of the drama. You, you need to move on. No? Or that is God's will. Wait a minute. <laughs> Silent. <laughs> and do not say that to a child with five years, please. Mm -hmm. That is suffering of cancer. That is not God's will. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, the sentence that I read at the end, that is the freedom of God that makes for us death. In the moment, that I stop to say, why are you sending me this? And you need to resign and accept the God will. The moment that you change that and I start to say and pray, I don't know why I am going through this. I cannot understand why I am moving in this direction. But the only thing that I know, the first sentence, that you are with me, and you will be with me, then it's going to be different. Please be conscious of your words when you are talking with people that is losing <coughs> others. Mm. Take really serious the drama of the death. Mm. Oh, no, he's in heaven. No? Wait, 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 no. Stay in the Good Friday. Please take an exercise. Mm -hmm. Stay in the Good Friday. Why does that mean? What does that mean? That God died. Stay there. Oh, no, what no, dies is, is the soul, is the body. It's not the soul. Stop. To, to leave that death is insignificant. We Christians have transformed the death insignificant. Just a changing of force and continue. It, you know, the, the soul is free. Sometimes it's better take really serious the pain of the other, be in silence, and give a good chicken soup. <laughs> and stop yeah. your opinions. Um, I just came from teaching a class at the law school that I teach on um, 
uh, meditate, uh, mindfulness and contemplative practices for yeah. lawyers that I designed, and tonight was the Brahma Viharas. And we yeah. did uh, Meta loving kindness yeah. meditation. And uh, two weeks ago, I was at um, IMS um, mm -hmm. out in Barrie for a retreat, uh, the essential Dharma of your life. I am a practicing Catholic. I'm Italian Irish, but uh, <laughs> but I but I can you be both? Can you be both? Because Buddhism, listening to you talk about how much compassion you've seen, okay. I, you know, while I'm out at IMS, there's little cups for we don't even kill insects. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's an insect, we gather it and you know bring it outside. There's so much compassion for the most lowly creature to yeah, everyone. Yeah. And I've done many retreats uh, um, at IMS because I'm <clears throat> MBSR certified, so I have to keep up my certification. Yeah, yeah. But um, I just, I'm wondering, can one be both Christian, in my case, Catholic and, and Buddhist? Because all of my reading, my bookcase in work, yeah. my bookcase at home, is all Thich Nhat Hanh, Sharon yeah. Salzberg, you know, the, so many, so many different. In fact, I was just thinking about taking a course from uh, Bhikkhu Analayo. Yeah. You know, can, is the, am I confused or can I? No. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I, I'll, I'll say a few words. So um, the question was like, can I be? And I would say like, from what I've seen, like over thirty plus years, is that like that can often be the case. I think it depends a lot upon the individual. Um, my, my brother, uh, younger brother, is married into a, a, a conservative Jewish family, Upper West Side, Manhattan. You know, socially very like progressive, but like it is very big part of their family and rabbis and therapists and everyone around. Um, and I remember years ago they shared with me this term that um, I, I remember them saying I believe it was appropriate of uh, Jubus. Uh, of like, like I'm Jewish and I'm always going out to like Buddhist meditation retreats. And I remember they gave me this book, it was entitled uh, The Jew and the Lotus, which was a book about how many people of, you know, Jack Kornfield and Sylvia Bernstein, like just how many people, yeah, yeah, of like, like Jewish background are like doing a lot of Buddhist practice and maybe feeling like I am Jewish, that's who I am, and I'm getting an enormous amount of nourishment from looking at Buddhist teachings and doing some meditation. Um, so I just, can I, I would just say like, I have seen that. So obviously it is, it is what people do. Um, and I would say from the side of Buddhism, um, it's a very open-handed you know, sort of approach. There's not a um, emphasis on, on converting people. What you choose to call yourself is entirely up to you. It's more of the gentleman at the back said there of like, how could I move my, improve my practice of gratitude? How could I improve my practice of seeing the impermanent nature of things? How you wish to fill out a survey, that is entirely up to you. You know, we can talk about our practice of these principles, and if you enjoy the techniques put a taught, you're most welcome, you know, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I've often, you know, when I, I taught for 13 years in Seattle, and, um, yeah, I was amazed, like, like the people who would come through on Sunday mornings, like a large majority would not fill out a survey saying they're Buddhist, mm -hmm. which is very different. My understanding when I grew up in United Church was like to take communion here, I needed like the ID card and like, you know, like can you approach the front? It was very like, have you joined? You know, and generally, you know, in a larger Buddhist gatherings, no one's checking ID. You know, it's, it's like you're actually welcome if you'd like to listen and practice great, you know, and what you choose to call yourself uh, or what box you fill out in a survey uh, is entirely up to you. You know, so it would vary. So I think over the years, I probably fill out a survey saying like, I'm just a Buddhist, you know, but someone individual, you know, may, you know, have a different identity. It can be very individual. Does that help a little bit? And yeah, yeah, yeah Felix has an interesting comments as well. Yeah, it means, to be Catholic is to be universal. Okay. And mm. then I don't have any problems to, so, to call my Shangha, my church. And I don't see, it's gonna be more work mm -hmm. because obviously your mind is gonna tell you fake, <laughs> fake. 
Are you here praying to Brajapani? <laughs> in a state to be praying to Jesus. But you're going to be like exercising how your mind brings mm -hmm. you to the traps that is beyond of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't see any, any problem to be Catholics <laughs> and to be open to learn of the other. Mm -hmm. But what is it? What I do? I do learning. <laughs> I feel so grateful. <laughs> I don't go to teach. He yeah, teach yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> Emptiness. <laughs> Fun question. Nobody. And I'd like to continue with the previous question because he's very interested as a theology student. Can we do both? And uh, please forgive me if my interpretation of Professor Felix's um, understanding is wrong. Uh, so as a Catholic, I am baptized as a Catholic. And does it mean that uh, we can practice like Buddhist uh, spiritual tradition uh, as a liturgy, and at the same time maintain our Catholic identity uh, because if we go deeper, and I think the, the, uh, the foundation of those two religions are different. Like, as Catholic, we believe in God, God exists, and we believe in the soul, but I'm not sure, uh, so which uh, school uh, does a teacher again come from? Is it from a pure land, a Buddhism, or from the Zen? Uh, Mahayana tradition. Okay, Mahayana yeah. tradition. So w what I have learned from the uh, Buddhist uh, comparative theology class is that uh, Zen doesn't talk about the existence of God and the soul. So which means that if we really proclaim that I am a Catholic, at the same time I am a Buddhist, and that there will be a confliction mm -hmm. on this notion of God or notion of the ultimate reality. Because the Buddhism, some schools, they don't talk about that. So does it mean that the uh, reconciliation or uh, solving of this problem depends on the personal uh, conception or per uh, uh, perception of uh, what your self-identity is? I can embrace the, I mean, I can learn from the other religion, but there will be one main uh, identity that I want to keep and then there should be boundaries. At the same time, there should be some openings for me to learn from other religions. I don't know if my understanding is correct or not. Which means that I cannot proclaim I am a Catholic. At the same time, I am a Buddhist. Thank you. In, in my experience, when we die, uh, the concept of emptiness, it helped me a lot. Because emptiness is not empty. It's in the relationship. What Pope Francis has said so many times, we are all interconnected. It means I will not go to heaven, and again, heaven is not a space, it's a person. A person that was talking with so other people, never mm -hmm. asked, <coughs> why are you feeling all the requirements. It means all religions are just temporary and historical things. I mean, all religions are just historical forms. What remains when we die is not the right that I will go to heaven because I am Catholic. We are not going to be asked how Catholic you were, we're going to we ask how much love you give. And we are going to be judged for the love and by love that we give. Not because I was Jesuit or Catholic or charismatic or neocatechumenal. Then we leave behind all the historicals and formal things that help me to be human and humanize me. I mean, religion 
comes from religare, for religere. It's not a vine, it's a rewind. It's not just a union, it's a reunion. Religion is not just a dogma and rites. It's a way how I rewind and bind to the transcendence, whatever transcendence it is, to the others, and to the other, the reality. All religions invite me to read and reread, read and reread Latin, mm -hmm. legere, religere, religion, or religare, rewind. Religions allowed me to bind and rewind, reunite with the transcendence, whatever transcendence it is, with my brothers and my sister, mm -hmm. and with the reality. That is what religious is. Then all forms that allows me to bind and rebind again with the transcendence, with the others, it is a way to humanize and to bring God into the earth. Let me say something. Uh, so many times I pray in the prayers until the sansara ends. So many times <coughs> until the sansara ends. Your kingdom come. For me it has been so close each time that I pray until the sansara ends. Sansara is the reality of sufferings. At the same time, your kingdom comes. Kedru taught me how to offer some mandalas, a poor land. Each time that I receive the communion, I receive the present, the past, and the future of the whole humanity not just my life. Each time that I receive the communion, I receive the present, the future, and the past of my life. <clears throat> but not just my life. I receive the past, the present, and the future of the whole humanity. The glorified body of Jesus, as well as the mandala. I offer a poor land. Mm -hmm. So wonderful. Amen. I think that's a great place to stop. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Please join me in thanking our presenters.